Hey family, Pastor Alex here. Thank you so much for taking the time out today to watch this video. If you've enjoyed this video or were inspired by this video, would you mind hitting the like or subscribe button? One, it helps us send you notifications whenever we post a new video. And two, it helps us preach the gospel to many more people out there. If you would like more information about our student ministry, go to cfmiami.org slash students and you can find more resources there as well. Thank you so much again. God bless you all. Oh, yo, 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 what's going on CFS? Come on, let's give Jesus a shout of praise in this place. ARPB, all of our campuses, God bless, God bless. If this is your first time here today, whether PB, Redland, West Kendall, Doral, downtown, can we give it up for our first time guests in this place? Come on, come on, come on. We are so glad you are here at your campus, man. And not only that, but we pray that this becomes a home to you. And we also got some exciting news. Today, we're announcing that not only, it's kind of bittersweet, not only is it downtown's last day with Doral at the Doral campus, but December 4th, we're having our soft launch for our downtown youth ministries. Come on, come on. Let's give Jesus a shout of praise. So over there at Doral, man, DT, we love you. Man, this is gonna be an amazing season for us. It's gonna be awesome. And it's not just gonna be something we say because we have something big planned in January that we're all gonna be able to witness what that new downtown campus looks like. So stay tuned, and it's gonna be awesome. So thank you so much for joining us today. You are, we're joining in a series called Help My Unbelief. We are closing out this series today. I mean, to kind of set this up, I wanna talk about a polygraph machine because I truly believe that a polygraph machine is one of the greatest technological advances that we've had as a human race. If you don't know what a polygraph machine is, simply the polygraph machine is a machine created to extract the truth from people. It was a machine that was created so that if you were lying, it was able to detect if you were a liar. And I'll never forget the first time I've ever witnessed a polygraph machine. I was in fourth grade and I was watching this movie called Meet the Parents. And it's a movie that came out in the year 2000. Maybe you were born, maybe you weren't. It's, I'm dating myself. But it was a pretty funny rom-com type movie. And it had Ben Stiller, Robert De Niro. And the whole concept of the movie was that a, a Ben Stiller was going out with this girl and he was meeting her parents for the first time. And her parent, little did he know that her father was an ex-CIA agent. And as he woke up one day, as he's sleeping over the house, he woke up one day at like one, two in the morning, and he starts traveling the house, and he's walking around, and he ends up in the basement where, where he's hiding all his gadgets and gizmos as an ex-CIA agent. And as he's looking through all that stuff, he, he ends up finding out a polygraph machine. And as soon as he discovers it, in comes in, pops. And he's like, hey, what you doing there, buddy? And he's like, oh, I'm just, I'm just here looking around and this and that. And as he's looking at the polygraph machine, he goes to him, he's like, you want to try it out? And he's like, nah, I'm good. I, I, don't, I, don't, think he, you know, I don't think I want to try it out. And he's like, no, you don't got nothing to hide, right? You're just telling the truth. You have nothing to hide. And so, matter of fact, this is a clip of that part of that movie. Yeah, it's an antique polygraph machine. Is that what that is? Because I've seen these before, but I never saw one actually up close. You know what? Why don't you try that on? Oh, that's okay. Oh, come on. We'll have some fun. I'll show you how it works. Yeah, I, just, I, I, I shouldn't. Well, why should you be afraid? You have nothing to hide. <laughs> no, I know. I know you know, so there shouldn't be any problem. No, there's no problem. So, try it on. Okay. I'll help you. Don't worry. You'll enjoy this. Right. Looks complicated. Now, these aren't 100% accurate, right? They're... Well, you'd be surprised how accurate they are. They can tell fairly easily if someone's lying or not. Now I'm going to ask you some questions, and all you have to do is answer yes or no. Okay. All right. Let's give it a whirl. Did you fly on an airplane today? Yes, I did. No peeking. Did we eat pot roast for dinner tonight? Yes. Was it undercooked? No, it was rare. It was a little rare for my taste. But I... I'm but just I kidding. I'm just... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> relax, relax. The needles are jumping. Yeah, that's a polygraph machine right there. Yeah, I mean, you can clap it up, I guess. But it's a movie, right? 
So the polygraph machine, wouldn't it be amazing? Sometimes you look at a polygraph machine and you'd be like, man, I wish sometimes in life I had a pocket-sized polygraph machine. Sometimes I just want, I wanted to know if this person was lying to me or if that person was actually telling the truth. And then I could just take it out and put it on them and see if they're telling me the truth. Wouldn't that be amazing? Matter of fact, I want to bring that over to today's teaching. Because sometimes in the same way, in the same way, we look at questions that we have about God or about the Bible and we wish that we could just hook up a polygraph machine to these questions we have about God. Like, God, are you real? God, is this Bible really your word? And how do I know it's not full of errors or contradictions like other people say? God, I wish I just knew if I had a polygraph machine to put it on. Now, we might not have a polygraph machine to hook up onto this Bible so we can know if it's God's word or if it's true. But there are multiple things that we can do to realize that what we are dealing with here is really the word of God. Because maybe you might be here, maybe you've been coming the last couple weeks and the first week you were here for our series, you figured out when Lewis answered the question, is there a God? And he preached on, is there a God? And he didn't just say, oh, because we read the Bible. No, he brought evidence, not speculation, that there is a God out there. And then next week you followed up and you heard Gabe from our Doral campus come, come here and preach, okay, if there is a God out there, maybe that's you sitting right now, if there is a God out there, how do I know that this God is the real God? When there's so many gods, how do I know that that God is real, Jesus? And he answered that last week, and now today we're gonna answer, if Jesus is the one and only true God, is this really his word? Is this truly 100% God's word? And if I believe in it without doubting that there's any holes in the back, any contradictions, any errors, is this really God's word? And that's what we're gonna find out today as we fit, finish off the series, Help My Unbelief. So we have two big thoughts. Somebody say two at all of our campuses. Two big thoughts, two questions we're gonna answer today when it comes to the word of God. The first question is this. How do I know that the Bible is the truth from God? How do I know that the Bible is actually the truth from God? And the second question we're gonna answer today is how, what, what makes the Bible special? Like why is the Bible special? What makes it that way? And so with that being said, if you have your Bible, we're gonna be in 2 Timothy chapter three. You can flip there, but before we read, we're gonna, we're gonna pray and we're gonna thank God for today. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you, God, for this day, Lord. We pray and thank you, God, for one, Lord, the opportunity to open up our downtown campus, even with our youth group there, God. We are waiting, we are excited for what's gonna happen in that city, Lord, the middle school and high schoolers that are gonna be at that campus, God. We're so thankful. God, and even today, as we close off this series, Lord, I pray for anybody here in this room, watching online at any of our campuses, any curiosity, any stirring of their heart, that today may be a day that may be clear as day, that they know that this is your word without a shadow of a doubt. We thank you, God, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Come on, come on, let's get it. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse, 13, uh, verse 16, this is what the word of God says. It says, all scripture, look at your neighbor, say all scripture. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This scripture tells us that all of it, from Genesis to Revelation, all of it was breathed out by God. It was him who inspired the scripture. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down as your first point. Write this down as your first point. How do we know that the word of God is the truth of God? Is this. God's word still stands. God's word still stands. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, because if God's word is truth, and it is true, then that word will stand, right? It would be the longevity of truth doesn't fade away. The longevity of truth stays. It is preserved. Matter of fact, we can try to hide truth sometimes. We can try to silence truth sometimes. But in most of our lives, we have tried to lie and maybe we did for a day, maybe we did for a week, maybe we did for a month, but one day, the truth ended up coming back to us. And I'm sure a lot of us, not only in this room, but watching online, a lot of us has dealt with that. Matter of fact, I remember a vivid story in my life. I was in middle school, I was in eighth grade. And many of you know, I have three brothers, so it's four of us, four of us siblings, I'm the third one. And we're all two years from each other, so we kind of grew up pretty tight-knit. And so we had a pact. Funny enough, I don't know how report cards are now. I'm pretty sure you could just hop online, go to a portal and look at your grades or whatever it might be. And I'm sure your parents are all over it. 
But growing up, that's not how it was for us. The parents would just expect your student, which is me, to come home with a paper that was in an envelope that had a report card in it with no accountability. We didn't have to sign it. We didn't have to give it back. Nothing. It was like, hey, here's your report card. Make sure you give it to your mom. God bless you. So imagine that. I'm sure you're probably thinking in your head, oh, I can get away with that. Easy. So imagine me and my brothers. We had a pact that every time the report card came out every nine weeks, if any of us would get a bad grade, we wouldn't show our parents. And you know, there's no snitching in the family, right? You know, we got we to gotta honor the pact. And we were, I was able to get away with it. Me and my brothers were able to get, get away with it for a year and a half. A year and a half. All of my seventh grade year and to the half side of my eighth grade year. And I'll never forget how we got caught. It was a Sunday and me and my family were hanging out. We were in the car driving and my mom randomly brings up. She goes, hey, I haven't seen a report card from you guys in a very, very long time. And right there, we're in the backseat. We're looking at each other like, oh, snap, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> and, I, and I start speaking up. I go, no, no, um, they're not giving. I, I haven't got a report card. I'm, you know, whatever. And then my other brother chimes in. He's like, yeah, yeah, we ain't got no report cards. I don't know. And my mom's like, oh, man, you know, I, wanna, I feel like calling the school and seeing what's going on. I don't know why we ain't got no report cards. And I'm like, oh, boy. But we ended up getting away with it, right? We're like, oh, man, we, we've been on this live for a year and a half already. And two days later, no lie, my mom's picking me and my little brother up from middle school early because we had a doctor's appointment. And as we're walking out into the car, she finished picking us up. We're going to go to this doctor's point. We're getting in the car. We get in it. My mom's going to the front seat. And you know those digital signs they got in the front of the school? It says the school name and it has like all these words on it or whatever. Guess what it says on there? Parents, report cards were sent home. And we're in the car and she double looks. She looks like that. And she gets in the car and she goes, hey, this sign says that the report cards were sent home. Where, how come I haven't seen any report cards? And I started sweating bullets. My brother started sweating bullets. But I felt I was good because I had good grades. I didn't have to hide it. I'm like, yo, they're stuck. You know, we've been hiding for a year and a half, but they're stuck. And so we got home. She goes, when we get home, I'm on all the report cards. And I kid you not, I remember that day like it was yesterday. It was crazy in the household. Let me just say that. But as long as we try to hide that truth, we know one thing is that the truth, you can try to hide it for a year. You can try to hide it for a day. You can try to hide it for a month. But you cannot suppress or silence the truth. The truth will always be told. And the truth will always be the light in a dark place. And I say that because God's word is truth because of its longevity and perseverance through prosecution. What do I mean? There have been so many times in history that the word of God has been outlawed. There have been times where Caesars and kings has declared, hey, if not only you're a believer, but if we catch you with one of these scrolls, you're done. They banned them from cities. They banned the Bible from libraries. They banned the Bible from whatever. Even till this very day and up until this point, guess what? We still have the Bible. We still have the living word of God. Matter of fact, I'll never forget in the 1700s, you probably, if you're in high school, you probably know about the famous philosopher Voltaire. And Voltaire was a French philosopher in the 1700s, and he's famous for multiple philosophical things. But there's one thing that he said in the 1700s. He said that before he dies, the word of God will die out. He says before he dies, in his lifetime, he believed that people were not reading the Bible anymore. He believed that the teachings in the scripture were irrelevant during the time. People didn't want to look at it anymore. And he said, you know what? The word of God, before I die, no one's going to read this book. This book is going to die off and be gone with. And here's the most ironic thing of it all. He ended up obviously dying before the Bible. And not only that, but his house in which he lived became a printing press for the Bible itself. So not only did the Bible continue to live on after him, but his own home was used as a printing press to print out the truth of God consistently and daily till this day, which is insane. That's only God. God's word is true and it will continue to stand. And not only that, because you might be thinking to yourself, well, God, well, well Pastor Alex, I'm going to be honest with you. If this is the truth of God, wouldn't it be easy to understand? There's so many people come up to me. It's like, man, I try to read the Bible, Alex. I try to read the Bible and let, let me tell you, I open it, I read a story. I'm like, what is this about? How am I supposed to understand this? Who's this person? Who's that person? How is the Bible truth if I cannot understand it? And I will always say this. You and I both know, and I would hope so, that two plus two equals what? Four. Come on, come on. All of our campus, two plus two equals what? Four. That's truth, right? It's truth. It equals four. That's truth. But let me tell you, if I bring my daughter up here on this stage, 
And I go to her in front of all y'all. If y'all know my daughter, she's little. She, and I go, Maya, what's two plus two? She'll say a random number. She'll, she'll go up here and she'll be like, 400. What? Two, what's two plus two? She'll say 40. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because she doesn't understand two plus two. Now, just because she doesn't understand two plus two, does that mean that it's not true that it's four? It doesn't. And so that, that logic of like, man, I don't understand the word of God. I don't, I don't understand what's happening in here. Is it really true of it? Because you don't understand it doesn't mean it's not true. It is still going to be true. Just because I'm not a physicist, that doesn't mean, and I don't know, phys, uh, you know physics, that doesn't mean that it's not true. I just got to get to a point where I'm studying hard and I get into that point. It's the same way. When I was a believer, I didn't, I was reading the Bible too, just like many of y'all. I'm like, who's this? Who's Zebedee? What kind of name is that? What's a Nebuchadnezzar? Is that a person or a fruit? Like, I don't know. But it took time to read and to get to know it because this is the truth of God and it's important. And so because it's truth doesn't mean it's not easy to understand. It just means because it's true, you have to continually pursue it. You have to pursue the truth. And so it brings us to the next point. But before I get there, because a lot of us also have questions. We're like, okay, if the word of God has been standing the test of time and its longevity is proof that it's God's truth, that no one's able to silence the Bible, no one's able to stop the Bible from being produced. What is going on? Why do I keep hearing that men wrote the Bible? Why do I keep hearing that men wrote the Bible, that it wasn't really God who wrote the Bible? Like, that's one of my doubts in my head because I'm okay with believing in Jesus, but when it comes to this Word of God, this artifact, this manuscript that's super, super, super old, how do I know that it was God who wrote it? And I always go to 2 Peter chapter 1 because God explicitly wanted us to make sure that we knew it was Him who wrote the Bible, especially to that question. This is what the Word of God says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. It's going to be up here behind me. It says this. It says, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of what? What's that next word? Scripture. Scripture. The Bible, no prophecy of the Bible comes from someone's own interpretation. That means it doesn't come from that person. And it says in verse 21, it says, for no, one, for no one prophesied ever was produced by the will of man. Look at this next part. It says, but men spoke from who? God. As they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Here's what God's saying. Hey, even as... Peter is writing this. The Holy Spirit is carrying Peter as he's writing the scripture to say that it's not Peter who's writing this. That's amazing. It's saying, hey, this word of God was breathed out by me from Genesis to Revelation, and that is the truth. The truth is that God inspired the word, and it is living and active, as it says in the book of Hebrews. That means that it's like having a conversation with God. Because the Bible is living and active, it's like God is always speaking to you. And I promise you, some, maybe at your, a campus where you're at, one of our leaders here at Palmetto Bay and other campuses, I'm sure you've experienced it. Or maybe some of our, some of our uh, students as well. Have you ever read a Bible verse and you're reading it and you're like, man, this is blessing me today. And you can read the same Bible verse two days from there and it means something completely different and it's still blessing you. That's what it means that the Word of God is living and active. That the same words that you're reading today can mean something completely different that God wants you to know three days later or a month later. And you're like, man, I read this passage like a year ago and it means something completely different today because the Word of God is living and active and it is true. So that means that God is continually speaking to you. He is always talking to you. Every time you read, He is talking to you. He's living and active. That is the truth of God. And so you might be thinking to yourself, well, if that's the truth, then what makes the Bible so special? Well, pretty much everything I've said makes the Bible special. But to add more, write this down as your second point. The Bible, the reason why it's special is because the Bible is one of a kind. There is no other book like that. You see, the Bible is made up of 66 individual books to compile the scriptures, right? The, what we see, the, what's breathed out by God, what's inspired by God. It is one of a kind. Now, if you know anything about one of a kind, a lot of people like taking up hobbies that make sure that they discover things that are one of a kind or things that are special. There are people who take up hobbies like looking for that one car that they made 400 years ago and they're like, yo, I'm the only one who has it. Or they start collecting cards like, hey, I want the rookie card of Stephen Curry or LeBron James and they want to be the only one to have it. It's one of a kind. Or even see streamers who open up packets of Pokemon cards. Y'all see what I'm talking about? They'll be like, oh, I want to find that one card that nobody has. 
because it's one of a kind. And so they'll stream it live and they'll put their, their, their camera on. They're like, okay, fresh pack. And by the way, this is actually a fresh pack. God bless. Hey, what if I find something crazy? I don't even know. But look, so they'll open up the thing. They'll open it up and they'll be like, okay, guys, look, this is what we got. And so we're trying to find a one of a kind card, right? And so they go, boom. I don't know if that's good. I don't know if that's good. God bless me. And they're going, these all look normal. Try to look for something shiny. And they're going like that. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And so they see some. Oh man, look, I got a shiny card right here. Oh, that's good. That's good. Hey, that's one of a kind. Hey, see how much you're worth and we'll split the difference. And then we'll split the difference. But then that's the exciting part. They'll look at him like, oh my goodness, I have whatever that is. It's one of a kind. I'm the only one who has it. That's what the Bible is to a lot of people who believe in Christ. The Bible is one of a kind. And the reason why, the reason why is because of a multitude of things. When you look at the word of God, not only just looking at the truth being preserved over time, when you look at how the Bible was integrated, how the Bible was made, it's such an amazing thing. The Bible is so special because it's one of a kind because this is the only book in the entire world that was written by over 40 different authors. 40 different authors. Wait, 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 wait. That's not the end. If that's already interesting to you, then God bless. You're going to see more. Because this is the only book that's written by 40 different authors. It was written on three different continents. It was written in three different languages. It was written over a span of 1,500 years. It's a long time for a book, right? And not only that, but it was written in different moods. It was written with people who were depressed, suicidal, people in joy, people in happiness. It was written by different positions. It was written by kings. It was written by prisoners. It was written by peasants and slaves. It was written by people who didn't have a home. It was written by people who were stuck in a place that they didn't know how to get out of. It was written not only in all these different modes, uh, moods and all these different titles, but this book of God is the most sold book of all time. It is the most stolen book of all time. It is the most translated book of all time. This book, in the span of all that, has one message that never contradicts. With all that being said, has one message, that Christ came to die for you, to take the punishment that we all deserve on the cross for eternity. He took that punishment so that if you believe in him, you'll have eternal life. I want you to understand that if I was able to get one person at each campus right now, if I got one person at Palmetto Bay, one person at Redland, one person at West Kendall, one person at Doral, one person at uh, downtown, even one person who's at home out watching online. If I were to get one of each person, I brought them all to the stage right now, as you guys are watching, and I gave each one of them a notepad to write one paper, one paper on a tough topic. Let's say, who's the GOAT of football, the GOAT of basketball, and the GOAT of baseball? Let me ask y'all, if they were all on here and they had to write one page, on just that, do you think all of them will have the same message? No? Do you think they're going to have the same characters on there? Do you think, did you see how impossible, that's just five, six people. This book was written over a span of 1,500 years on three different continents, three different languages, 40 different authors, but has one message that never contradicts from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Why? Because we know the real author is Jesus Christ himself. This is God's word. It is his truth. It is preserved in time. God's word is so unique and special. There is no other book like it. And let me tell you, in the same way that this book is special and this book is one of a kind, God has made you special and one of a kind. Every single one of us who's watching right here, watching online, I want you to understand that when God made Adam and Eve, when he made, when he made man in the beginning, he made them in the image of God. You are the highest, most precious form of creation to God. You were made in his image. No other creature, not even angels, had that honor to be made in God's image, and yet we were made in God's image. In so much that when we sinned, that Christ loved us so much, he was finding a way to take our punishment so that we would not go and be deserving of the punishment of sin that we have. And so God, in so much as loved you and knew you and made you special and one of a kind, sent his son Jesus to die for you, to die for you at all of our campuses. Because each and every single one of you who are hearing me right now, every single one of you have a different talent to bring to the table. You have a different purpose in your life that God has for you, that you have a purpose 
that is beyond what you can think or imagine, that God has made you uniquely with value. And some of you are walking around believing the lie that the devil has gave to you, that you are worth nothing, that God, you are just here by evolution, you are just as valuable as the roach on the side of the road. That is, the far, that is far from truth. Because the truth tells us in the word of God that you are unique and special and that he wants a relationship with you, a personal relationship with you. And if you're watching right now, whether you're right here at Palmetto Bay or online, I want to give you the opportunity to do exactly that, to have a relationship with a God who made you special and unique. And in Romans 10, 9, it tells us simply that we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. You will be saved. You'll be in eternity with God in heaven. You will be on this side of life. You will be in freedom. And all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Christ is Lord. And so right there where you're at, I want everybody, all of our camps, I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Because if that's you and God is stirring your heart, because you're listening to this message and you're thinking, that is truth. Or maybe you're listening to this message and you're saying, hey, I, I want to believe, but what, what is this plan that God has for me? Well, the first step is knowing and believing that God made you special and unique. And he sent his son Jesus because he loved you so much. And if that's you right now and you're like, I want to pray, I want a relationship with Jesus. Right there we're at, in your head, you're praying to God, you're not praying to me. If that's you. Just repeat after me, I'm, I'm, I wanna guide you to a prayer and say, Father in heaven, God, I thank you for this day. Lord, I believe in the truth of your word and I confess now with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Father, from this day forward, I live a life that is honorable to you that I glorify your name even if I don't understand what I'm doing. God, I love you. I thank you and I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen and amen.